Shalom and howdy everybody welcome back to another amazing installment of the Minder series with me Batya and Sat as usual uh, I'm so sorry I really wanted to do a video last week and it got away from me and what I have found it's like prayer for me if I don't jump on it like first thing in the morning then it escapes me throughout the day and I really have to get better at doing it at the beginning of the week because now it's Thursday and I am crunch for time that I thought like if I don't do it today there's no way we can go two weeks without a Midrash video when we're so close to finishing Vayikri. You guys, we are close. We are just so close. And then we're moving into when God brings the Jews into the land of Israel and so much juicy, amazing Midrash. You're going to be very excited. I promise. I promise you. Okay. So having blabbed about that, I just want to say that uh, you may or may not have heard we had uh, a string of attacks um, this past Shabbat, three different attacks, uh, Friday night, um, seven Jews were murdered, uh, uh, massacred at a synagogue, and then um, the next day um, a terrorist attacked uh, two people. Uh, one that he shot actually uh, shot him back, but while he was in stable condition, he has recently been moved to critical condition. So I would ask you if you could take a moment and if you could please read one verse of Tehillim, not one verse, one chapter. You know, it's like there's 150 of them and just pick one. You know, it doesn't have to be so long. It, it really even one verse, one line of Tehillim is so, Psalms, is so, so, so powerful. If you could please do that for the speedy recovery of Nadav Chaim Ben Erit Chaya, I will put that name, Bezrat Hashem, in the description that he should have a recovery. And, um, <laughs> man, it gets me every time because you know, this man, he is, the nation of Israel is a body, and we all, the truth is, is like we say, you know, Jews and Jews and Jews, but the truth is, all of humanity, we're all a, a body, you know, um, but um, within the Jewish community, um, we really cling to each other, because there's been a lot of oppression, <laughs> And that like, when one of us is hurt, we're all hurt. And this man, he is our father. He is our brother. He is our husband. He is our son. And, um, you know, I just think about after recently going through my own loss, just like, not even just the life of this one man, but all the people that have lost their loved ones. Um, during this attack you know one of the boys in the synagogue was 14 14 and he would save his money to buy people in the neighborhood food and have it secretly delivered to them and this beautiful life was taken out and i can only i just think of my own son and so if you could just take a minute, and I know we're all busy, and read one chapter of Tehillim for Nadav Chaim ben Irit Chaya. You know, um, and then there was a third attack uh, after that. Thank God that uh, after he shot a bullet, the gun jammed, and then he ran away. I don't even know if they, they caught him, but um, Israel is in mourning. <laughs> wow, I am emotional today. Woo! This learning, please, God, should be in the merit of these holy souls. That they should have um, Eloi <clears throat> for their souls and for those that have been injured, that they should have a refua shlema and that God should comfort the mourners of Israel. <laughs> Woo! 
I'm not into this crying on camera and putting it onto the internet. That's not my scene. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes the emotions bubble up. What's the saying? When the heart is full, the eyes overflow. So God bless us that we should just love you and serve you and love each other. I mean, mamash, that is... That is what it's about at the end of the day. Okay, enough jibber jabber. Let's get down to business. We're so close. So last video, a million years ago, we were talking, uh, I wanted to get to this topic of slavery uh, because uh, it's so interesting, especially I feel like with, um, you know, everything going on currently in the world and people's idea of slavery and oppression and especially with really anti-semitic tropes about jews and 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 to explain that the concept of slavery according to the jewish law where you absolutely could own a slave is completely different than as the world knows slavery or practices slavery i also did I make a note later to mention this or am I going to jump ahead of myself? But I also really want to mention that uh, it's I, <laughs> I got in a fight with someone once quite some time ago when I was new to my practice. Um, and it was with a native Hebrew speaker and then my own really weak Hebrew, which is really funny because my beginning of understanding of Hebrew comes from like religious study which is very interesting enough, very different than modern Hebrew itself. And so um, the word, and I also could be wrong, so if you tell this to someone and they're like, that's not right, maybe that's possible. For my own understanding, it's that the word, we call like service to God, avodat Hashem, the avoda, like the work, the service of God right and we are of day hashem we are servants of god and so like in hebrew there's not really a difference in the word servant and slave and slave has really negative connotations so really probably if you um translated that really literally we wouldn't be servants of god we would be slaves to god but as i've said before the only free man is a man that is a slave to the truth so i'll be a slave for god any day of the week but it's funny so when we talk about the word slave or slavery let's get into what the torah says about slavery and how you must treat a slave so there is a commandment to treat one's hebrew servant well So, um, in the book of Vayikra, uh, it talks about the laws regarding a Hebrew slave sold by a Beit for thievery, okay, or a Hebrew slave that sold himself. Now, a Jew may not sell himself as a slave in order to earn money, acquire property, animals, or other good. The Torah only permits this for really, really dire uh, situations. A Jewish master is obligated to sustain not only the slave, but also his children and his wife as well. All the laws of treating... Oh, this is going to drive me crazy. I'm going to see if I can reach, close this door, or the wind will blow it and it will bang. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Maybe I'll edit that out. Maybe I won't. I probably won't. I'm very lazy about these things. Okay. So, all the laws of treating one's Hebrew slave as one's brother are equally applicable to a slave that sold himself. For example, the master must give him the same food and drink, garments and bedding as he himself uses. Okay, let's break this down because it really conflicts with our uh, idea of slavery. Meaning that if the master has a steak and an apple okay some of you might prefer apples 
Okay, that's fine. I'm from Texas, so I would never prefer an apple over a steak. That's me. It's my right as a Texan. That's neither here nor there. But, so say it's me. Say I have a slave. I have a steak and an apple. I have to give the slave the steak and I take the apple. Okay? That, so also for bedding, say, say there's two pillows. One is good and one is bad. I have to give the good one to the slave. Say I don't have two pillows. I only have one pillow. I am obligated to give the slave the pillow and I, the master, would not have the pillow. Are you hearing this? It's amazing. He may not offer him conditions inferior to his own. Should there be only one pillow, oh, here we go, or blanket for both the master and the slave, the Torah forbids the master to use it and he's obligated to let the slave have it. The master may not employ the servant day and night. He is obligated to give him proper time for rest. He must treat him with the same dignity as he would treat a hired laborer who is not his slave. Um, and also there is a prohibition against treating one's slave harshly. And it includes the following two points. A master may not demand of a Jewish servant to perform services which he doesn't really need. For example, if uh, he tells them, warm the water for me or cool the water for me, and there's no necessity for it. There's also an example of this given about the Jews uh, when they were slaves in Egypt. Technically, they weren't Jews yet. They were, what were they called? They weren't Ye Yehudim yet, officially. What were they called? Oh, it's escaping me. I might remember it later in the video. But one of the things that the Egyptians would do is they would make the Jews like run them a bath. And then they say, oh, no, no, it's too hot now. Cool it down. Oh, no, no, now it's too cold. Heat it up again. Two, he is forbidden to assign a Jew, a Jewish servant, a job for an indefinite period of time. For example, he may not command him, dig beneath this vine until I return without letting him know when he will return. This is also similar to um, the work that the Jews were forced to do in Egypt um, that uh, where they were commanded to build on sand that would sink. So like they keep building in this spot, building in this spot, but it's just building for building's sake. It's not even for purpose. It's really just for torture. Since what is considered harsh treatment depends on a particular circumstance and must therefore be left to the master's discretion, the Torah warns, and you shall fear your God. God knows whether you mean to degrade or exploit your slave. If you do, he will punish you. Although the prohibition against treating a slave harshly refers to a Hebrew slave, um, it's ruled that the righteous should not impose a heavy yoke upon any slave that they should be treated with digni dignity, they should not be oppressed, and they should be sustained according to the means of their master. Um, so that's such an interesting concept. So the concept is really that the master isn't just taking a slave to come and work for him. This is an act of Chesed. This is an act of kindness because it says that when a master takes a slave on, he's taking a yoke on himself because then he's responsible for caring for his entire family, sustaining his entire family, and making sure that he's treated as well as the master, if not better, depending on the resources available. And, and this is so interesting because in Torah law, right? There is this concept, it's about rehabilitation and not punishment. And something that we mentioned before is that you will not find, it is not a Jewish concept to have a prison. Yet, yeah, someone might be locked up for holding while judgment is being decided. But once that judgment has been decided, there's not like a place where you send all the bad people to live together because we know, right, this is a really, really bad idea because like there's this idea where when people go into jail, 
they don't become rehabilitated, they become even worse. They're hanging around bad people, they're learning even worse things, they come out with a stigma, you know, and so they revert back to a life of crime uh, or even, you know, uh, committing worse offenses. In the Jewish world, if somebody commits a crime, he is sent to go and live, he, oh, English, he sent to live in one of the Ere Miklads, one of the refugee cities. Why is this so interesting? Because we did cover this in another, but it's worth repeating. Because these are cities full of Kohanim and Leviim. Remember, they did not get portion a portion of the land like the other tribes. Okay? They're, they went to live in one of 48 refugee cities. So people that were not living the right life, their punishment was to go and live with people that were spiritually elevated so they could learn from them, not to learn from other criminals. How amazing. And it was also a punishment for the holy people of these cities because if their job is to serve on behalf of the public, if their job as the religious leaders of the nation are to pray and help educate people on how to be good, uh, then they're not doing their job. I heard a great, great quote the other day and it was, it says, <laughs> I really like this actually. If you're not going to be better tomorrow than you are today, what do you even need the Torah for? Boom. One more time. Let's say it again because it's music. It's just music to my ears. If you aren't, I mean, because all of you guys, y'all are learning Torah now. If you're not going to be better, if you're not going to be a better person tomorrow than you are today, why are you even learning Torah? And I'm saying it to you, really, I'm saying it to myself because it's true. If I can't really grab the day and say like, today, I've been better. I was a better human being than I was yesterday. What am I even doing? And even specifically, what am I even doing making YouTube videos? That's even crazier, you know? Okay. Well, that was a long rant, but it's so interesting. Ah, the Torah is so smart and good. It's almost like God knew what he was talking about when he made the Torah. Wow, it's wild. It's so wild. I had an iced coffee. I think the sugar in that is really making me like very excited. Okay, let's continue. Okay, not to prostrate oneself upon a stone floor. The Torah commands, do not bow upon a stone floor. This refers to a, f a floor covered with stones, if you didn't get that. The idol worshippers used to fall down before their idols on stone floors. The only place that we may prostrate ourselves upon such a floor is the Beit HaMikdash. Since the Torah prohibition refers only to stone floors, it is not forbidden to prostrate ourselves on Yom Kippur in the synagogues, whose floors are usually not made of stone. Nevertheless, it is our custom to spread something on the floor when prostrating ourselves during Yom Kippur. Okay. Hashem promises to bless our people for studying and fulfilling Torah. If all of the nation of Israel studies the Torah diligently and upholds its laws, the most wonderful blessings are in store for our people. These blessings encompass every type of bliss from Aleph to Taf, the last Hebrew letter. And they therefore begin with the letter Aleph <laughs> and end with the letter Taf. Okay. Redundant. They are awarded to our nation, Mida, Kenegid Mida, measure for measure for fulfilling the Torah from Aleph to Taf, from the beginning to end. Was the utopian state of the entire Jewish people studying Torah ever realized? Yet, it was, to an extent. One, the generation of the wilderness, which we're about to get into, Bizrat Hashem, when we finish this, uh, these Levitical laws, the Midbar wilderness. The Midbar, modern Hebrew, it means desert, Midbar, wilderness, biblical, which is the name of the next book. Numbers. Numbers. It's called, its name is Ba Midbar. Ba means in. Midbar is the wilderness, in the wilderness. So, 
In the generation of the wilderness, they were immersed in Torah study and termed a generation of knowledge. Yehoshua's generation, too, engaged itself in studying Torah. David Amalek and Shlomo Amalek, King David and King Solomon themselves, Torah scholars, urged every Jew to follow their personal examples. And Kiz, bleh, King Hizkiyahu enforced nationwide Torah study by planting a sword in front of the, the houses of learning and proclaiming that any Jew who refused to learn Torah deserved to be executed. All these Torah-observing generations enjoyed a good part of the blessing promised in this Parsha. They enjoyed health, strength, reign in its season, prosperity, and victories over their enemies. They were living proof of the verse, and all nations of the earth shall see that the name of Hashem is called upon you. Nevertheless, the full range of blessings did not yet come true, and the nation of Israel never reached the level of spiritual perfection necessary for the divine blessing to be bestowed in its entirety. The Almighty promised that all the blessings mentioned in this Parsha, this portion, will be fulfilled in the future when the nation of Israel will keep and study Torah. But good news, folks. We have more synagogues and more houses of learning and more Torah lectures online, on the computer, classes, books than we've ever had in the history of the world. So we are doing a good job. You are a part of it. I'm a, I'm a part of it. So we, we are, we're, we're working on it. We're mommish. We're really, really working on it. Um... The divine blessings are introduced with the words, If only all of you were to labor in my Torah. This is an entreaty, a plea to the Jewish people. The Almighty has no dearer wish than to sh shower us with blessings. He therefore begs us, please study my Torah and please fulfill my commandments so as to enable me to bless you. Why? Because... It's like holding water in your hands. It's just going to run through if you don't have the vessel. If you don't have the vessel to hold the blessing. And the Torah is what builds the vessel. King David stated, When I contemplated my ways, I turned my feet to your testimonies. Every day I considered going to this or that place and mapped out a program for the day. However, no matter what I had planned that day, I always ended up at your house of learning, studying Torah. When I began to walk, my feet led me to the Beta Knesset, the synagogue, and to the Beta Midrash, the house of learning. That's in Tehillim 119, chapter 119, verse 59. So there's two ways that the sages explain this. One, one, um, one view uh, of the sages is that David had acquired such holiness that all of his limbs automatically carried out the Creator's wish, therefore his feet of their own accord always carried him to a place of learning. According to another view, David had not yet reached this level, where he had totally eliminated his evil inclination, his Yetzirhara, and so daily he engaged in combat with the evil inclination, which persuaded him to spend the day with occupations other than the study of Torah. However, after he considered the reward of the mitzvot, versus the penalty for transgress transgressions, the blessing versus the reproof, and after he pictured himself the great, uh, sorry, and after he pictured to himself the great benefits of Torah study, he prevailed over his evil inclination and went to learn Torah. The daughters of Rav Chida begged him, Father, why do you not rest from your constant Torah study and take a little nap? And he replied, soon long days will come in the grave and they will be too short to study Torah and we will sleep a lot. Blessing, fruit producing rain at convenient times because rain is only a blessing depending on when it falls. Rain can also be a curse. If we fill the to <laughs> Wow. All right. If we fulfill the Torah, Hashem promises blissful, fruit-producing rain. This is the first blessing because rain determines the quality of the crop as well as the climate of the land, which affects people's health. 
The Torah declares that the rain will fall in its proper time. What is meant by the proper time? 1. Rain will fall at times of the year when it is needed for the produce to grow. There will be ample spring rain in Nisan and fall rain in Marcheshvan. Both the spring and the fall rain will be purely beneficial. The spring rain will not make the fruit soggy or flood the ground and the rainfall will not demolish houses or trees. 2. Rain will fall at times when people are not inconvenienced by it. For example, it will rain only at night in particular and on Wednesday nights when there's, there is an idea that there are harmful spiritual agents that roam outdoors in the darkness, specifically on Wednesday nights uh, and Friday nights. And Friday nights are not an issue because Jews, for the most part, should and hopefully are um, at the synagogue or at their home having a meal with their family. The blessing of rain was fulfilled in the time of the sage Shimshu. Oh, wow. Wowzer. See what happens when I get out of my flow? Then it takes a long time to get the machine running again. The blessing of rain was fulfilled in the time of the sage Shimon ben Shetach under Queen Shlom Tzion's reign. Rainfalls occurred on Friday night, and although no rain fell during the rest of the week, the wheat kernels grew to the size of kidneys, and the barley to the size of olives, and the lentils to that of a dinar coin. I have no idea what that means. The Hachamim collected and preserved these gigantic fruits for the coming generations to demonstrate the diminished productivity which is brought on by sin. The soil and the trees will be productive like in Adam's time. Of all the blessings, the main one is that the earth will be productive. A monarch was, uh, nopes, sorry. Hashem assur <laughs> assures the nation of Israel that their fulfilling the Torah causes the earth to be fertile. However, the divine blessing goes beyond that. Hashem promises, if you keep the Torah to perfection, perfection, good luck, the land will yield its produce, its original perfect produce, the way it was intended by the Creator before Adam sinned. This promise implies plants will mature on the same day that the seeds are sown. The fruit trees will bear fruit in a day's time and there will be no barren trees and every tree will produce some kind of edible fruit. Not only will the fruit trees be edible, but their bark will also be edible. The soil will bring forth delicious cakes and the mountains will drip fruit juice. Originally, Hashem intended the earth to produce rapidly and plentifully. As a result of sin, it was cursed by Hashem and deteriorated. In the future, when the Jewish people will devote their full time and energy to studying Torah, the curse of, with the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread, will once again be lifted and the earth will supply us abundantly as it used to. Working the ground will no longer be necessary and every Jew will earn a livelihood and ease, with ease, and thus be able to dedicate their full time to service of Hashem. Or slavery of Hashem. Am I right or am I right? Okay. Abundance and contentment with little. Oh no, I'm going to sneeze. Wait for it. Wait for it. Ah, watermelon. Okay. That works, by the way. If you have to sneeze and it can't come, say watermelon. Boom. Little trick, little trick for you today. Okay, abundance and contentment with little. As we say in the words, the, the wisdom of our fathers, who is a wealthy man? The man who is happy with his lot. Oh, it's so good and right. And your threshing shall extend to the vintage and the vintage shall reach the sowing time. The output will be so amazing that the threshing of wheat, which begins after the harvesting in Nisan, will last until the grape harvest, which is at the end of summer. And again, the grape harvest will be so blessed that it will continue until the time for sowing the next crop. However, continues the Torah, 
You will not need this abundance for yourselves because you shall eat your bread to satisfaction. This is a separate blessing. It connotes that in the future a Jew will feel perfectly satiated after eating only a minimal amount of food. What do we get from this blessing? Being occupied with eating and drinking takes up so much precious time. In the future, Hashem will reduce a Jew's physical wants, thereby granting him added opportunity for learning more Torah. It's just like, what do we know? What is the reward for doing a mitzvah? An opportunity to do another mitzvah. What is the reward for learning Torah? Opportunity to learn more Torah. Peace. Although in the previous blessing we are assured an abundance of food and drink, that promise <laughs> really means very, very little unless it's accompanied by the blessing of peace. No matter how much someone possesses, he cannot enjoy his wealth if he lives in constant fear. And therefore the Almighty assures, and I will bestow peace on the land, and you shall lie down, and no one shall make you tremble. Amen. May it be speedily in our days, Hashem. Yala Kadima. This assurance is essential for the enjoyment of all previous blessings. <sighs> emotional. I feel emotional today. The promised peace will be a perfect kind, unknown to us <laughs> today. Oh man, it's so hard. My son, he loves Jerusalem. And he, he always tells me when he's big, he's six, almost seven. Bezrat Hashem, Admei Vesrim. And uh, he's always telling me how he's going to live in Jerusalem and I'm going to come and visit him in his house when he's big in Jerusalem. And he just loves Jerusalem. And now he's like, I, um, I don't want to go. I'm scared. What if I go and somebody murders me? And it's really, it's such a hard conversation to have. Um with your child when they want to know why people want to murder them because they're Jews. And when almost every holiday we have, it's about how there was a nation that wanted to murder us because we were Jews. And I see him trying to work this out and process it and understand it in his mind. And it's very painful. So may this promised peace be a perfect kind unknown to us yet come speedily in our days in Israel and in all places in all places ah. Hashem is the big okay wild beasts will be harmless in Eretz Israel just as they were before Adam sinned the prophet predicted about the future and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the suckling child shall play at the hole of the snake as our sages taught specifically Hanina Bendoza, it is not the snake which kills, it's the sin which does, right? So like a little story, I, I'm sure we mentioned it before, but there was like this crazy monster snake that was going around biting and people were dying and this, the town was in a panic about it. And so he went over to the hole of the snake and he stuck his foot right in it. And he said, you see, the snake isn't the killer. It's the sin that's the killer because... Animals can't do anything unless God tells them to. So it's your sin that brought that upon you. Not you, not anybody. Ploni Almoni, Lo Alenu, Lo Al Avachad. Not on us and not on anybody. Okay, because words have power, right? Words are a creative act. It's been so long since you heard me say that. It was about time. Beasts become dangerous only because of man's sin. At the beginning of creation, they, subs they um, subsisted on herbs. That's true. We were originally created as vegetarians. And only after the flood did we get permission to eat meat. Um, so when we fulfill the will of the Almighty, animals have no power, they have no power to harm us and it can be seen on a face. I once heard, actually, I don't want to say it because I don't have a tight source and I don't want to throw around like Torah willy nilly. I'm not into that. You guys know I like my sources. Don't bring me any kind of information if you do not have a good source. I don't even want to hear it. Okay. 
Not only wild beasts, but all harmful powers will be subdued. The nations of the world termed wild beasts will no longer afflict the Jewish people. Hashem promises that Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, will be free of wars. Even strange soldiers... So Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, will be free of wars. Even strange soldiers on their way to meet their enemies in another country will not even cross through the land. In other words, there will literally be no sword passing through Eretz Israel. All right. So, King Yoshayahu misinterpreted this verse um, as applying it to his generation. So, during the reign of Yoshayahu, the king of Yehuda, the Egyptian king, Paro, was at war with the king of Assyria. And this is in uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st King, 2nd King, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Okay, what is that? 1st Chronicles, chapter 35, verse 20. Okay, he sent a message to Yoshayahu requesting the king of Egypt requested from the king of Israel to let his troops pass through Eretz Israel. And Yoshayahu refused, relying upon the Torah promise in this, in this verse, in Vayikra, that no sword shall pass through the land. Now, King Yoshayahu, he was a perfect tzaddik, and he therefore thought that this promise applied to his time. However, he made a mistake considering that his generation was as righteous as he was. He believed that Eretz Israel was free of idol worship since he had royal delegates sent to inspect every home in the country to ensure that no household possessed objects of idol worship. The delegates never discovered a single image anywhere and this was the official report which reached the royal palace but in reality they were deceived because people had installed in their houses special double doors which opened in the middle and they would place their idols behind each door half so when people when the delegates would walk in the room the door opened so the door was covering the idol and then when they left then the door was closed the idols were once again visible to those inside. <sighs> it's a blessing and the curse of the Jews. They're smart for good and for bad. <sighs> ah, Hashem Yerachem. Okay. When the prophet Yeremiah heard that Yoshiao had refused Paro, so the prophet Jeremiah, Yeremiah, when he heard that Yosh <laughs> Yoshiao had refused Paro's soldiers to pass through, he sent him a message of warning saying, you should let him pass. Um, my Rebbe, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, promised, prophesied, that the Egyptians would be smitten by their own brothers and not by you. Do not get involved in this fight. The king, however, ignored Yeremiah, Jeremiah, Yeremiah's advice, and replied, Moshe Rabbeinu was your Rebbe's Rebbe, and he assured us that in the Torah that no strange army would pass through our land. And despite the prophet Yeremiah's warning, King Yoshiao stationed his army at the border of Eretz Israel to refuse entry to the foreign troops. Now when Paro heard that the Jewish army would not let him pass and was in a state of readiness for war, he sent messengers to Yeshayahu, saying, What? I have to do with you, king of Yehuda. I am not coming against you today, but against the house with which I am at war. For my God commanded me to make haste. Do not meddle with the God who is with me so that he does not destroy you. When King Yoshiao heard the Egyptian invoking the name of his God, he said, Since he trusts in his idol, I am sure that the Almighty will grant me victory over him. Undaunted by Paro's message, Yoshayahu brought the Jewish army to the valley of Megiddo for battle. In the, ensuing, 
ensuing combat between the Jews and the Egyptians, the Jews were defeated. The enemy archers pierced King Yoshiao with 300 arrows so that his body became as perforated as a, a sieve. Yeshoyao ordered his servants, carry me away for I am seriously wounded. The servants lifted him from his royal chariot into a second chariot and brought him back to Yerushalayim. <clears throat> Dying, the king acknowledged, Tzadiku, Hashem is righteous for I rebelled against his mouth. I refuse to listen to his word as transmitted by the prophet Jeremiah, Yeremiah, and, uh, and that the Torah does not refer to my generation when it promises that no sword shall pass through the land of Israel. I am being justly punished for my refusal to listen. Yoshiao died and was buried in the tomb of his fathers, and he was mourned by all of Yehuda and Jerusalem. Miraculous victories. How are we doing on time? See where are we? Just have a little look. One second. Just one second. So close. <gasps> We're so close. Amazing. Okay. We'd probably get through a lot more information if I wasn't so rambly. But it's my video and I do what I want. The Torah further declares, And you shall pursue your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. This promise implies that when we fulfill Hashem's will, no combat on our part is necessary in order to defeat our enemies. We need merely pursue them, and they will fall by each other's swords. Oh, I, so true. Can't you just hear the truth of that smacking you in the face? One of the most important concepts of the faith is that when you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, God will make your enemies bow before you. And not that that should be like an envy or a, like a gaiva, uh, not envy, a pride thing. But it's like, if you are doing God's work the way he needs and wants you to do it, and I use the word need loosely, then he's not going to waste your time with these other things. Of course, there's an exception to every rule. And at the end of the day, Hashem does what he wants. And thank God for that. Even for the pursuit, we need not muster big armies. Five of the weakest Jews will put a hundred enemies to flight and a hundred of the weakest Jews, 10,000. From this verse, it is evident that the merit of a large congregation which serves the Almighty is improportionately greater than that of a small one. At the rate of proportion of five Jews chasing a hundred enemies, which is one to twenty, a hundred Jews should have the power to chase merely two thousand of their enemies. But the Torah teaches, however, that the spiritual power grows immeasurably out of all normal proportions. The impact created by an assembly of a hundred Torah observant Jews is so tremendous that it puts to flight tens of thousands. Hashem says, I shall turn to you and devote my loving care to your physical and spiritual increase. You will be blessed with many children who will grow up to resemble you morally and spiritually. Your greatness will grow with every child born because each will become a bearer of Torah and mitzvot, strengthening the bond between Hashem and His people. The harvest will improve with age. The Almighty guarantees... The produce stored in your granaries will not decay. On the, cron on the contrary, all produce will become more delicious and flavorful with the passage of time, not only wheat and wine, which normally improve with age. You will then find yourselves in a strange dilemma. Your granaries and pantries will be full of food when the new harvest comes in, but you won't want to clear out the old to bring in the new since the old one will taste so delicious. The Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, will dwell in our midst. 
the final spiritual blessing is this climax. And I will set my dwelling among... <laughs> I am emotional today. I don't know. Blah. And I will set my dwelling among you. The Almighty promises I will rebuild the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, wherein I will dwell. This Beit HaMikdash will be my handiwork descending from heaven, and it will therefore last forever. My Shechina will not loathe you, and you will never be exiled again. And I will walk among you. I will, as it were, walk in your midst in Gan Eden. Hashem will, if we can even say so, walk together with the righteous and tell them, don't be afraid, we are friends. Yet although they will walk, so to speak, in Hashem's company, the awe of His greatness will still be upon them. In the present world, the Shechina is perceived only by the great tzaddikim, the righteous. In the future, however, we learn in Isaiah, the glory of Hashem shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. May it be speedily in our days. In the future, the righteous will form a circle around Hashem, and He will be in their midst, and each one will point at Him and say, See, this is our God. We have hoped for Him. <laughs> and He has saved us. What concept do our sages wish to convey by picturing the tzaddikim sitting in a circle around Hashem and pointing at Him? The circle which is round and without end symbolizes the unending future joy and delight in the Shechina. Our pointing at Hashem denotes full clarity and understanding of Hashem which we do not possess today. Oh. Hashem says, Don't doubt my ability to fulfill my promises. Remember the miracle of Yetziat Misraim, the exodus of Egypt, I am the same God. I shall perform miracles for you in the future, and I shall break the bars of your yoke. A farmer who possessed a strong and healthy cow was asked by his neighbor to lend him an animal for plowing. <laughs> I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry in this story. Ooh, maybe because I said that, I canceled it out. A negative times a negative is a positive. Math is real. The farmer consented, unaware of what lay in store for his cow. That neighbor had ten grown sons. The first one harnessed the cow and plowed with it for many hours, and when he grew tired, he passed the animal on to his brother. The other brother, too, used the cow until he grew tired, and then he made the third brother continue the work. The poor animal had to plow on and on and never had a second's rest because there was always another brother to take over, and finally it collapsed from exhaustion. <laughs> When the farmer gathered his animal to the stable at night, the cow did not come despite being called. It laid on the ground, motionless, <laughs> bending over the animal. The farmer noticed that it could not move because of exhaustion. It had been worked to the bone. All upset about this abuse, he broke its yoke and fetched his shears and cut its straps, and he freed the animal to repay it for its suffering. The Jews in exile cry out that throughout thousands of years, the nations never abandoned their persecution of the Jewish people. And as soon as one nation relaxes its evil schemes, another one takes over. The Almighty promises that in the future, even before sitting in judgment over the nations, He will first break the bars of the nation of Israel's yoke once and for all. This is the meaning of the ab above blessing, and I shall break the bars of your yoke. Hashem says, you will walk with your heads erect like a person who is not afraid of anyone. The nations will fear you because you will bear the Kedusha of the Shekhinah on your face. In the future, I shall increase your height. After Adam sinned, his height was 100 amot. Hashem promises that each person will be at that height. According to a different opinion, everyone will be double that height, 200 amot. And according to other views, this refers to even greater heights. How are we to understand this Midrash? First of all, we don't really understand any Midrash, yet we love the Midrash. Okay. When Adam sinned, his height shrank to the size of a dwarf compared to his former stature. This was the external sign of his tremendous spiritual decline as compared to his Kedusha before he had sinned. Conversely, in the future, the physical stature will be expanded, reflecting 
one's spiritual growth. Although all, all will be conversant with Torah in the future, their spiritual levels will differ. Accordingly, they will not all be of the same physical height. Someone who comprehends the Torah on a simple level is promised a height of 100 amot. On a more profound level, 200 amot. And if he penetrates the deepest secrets of the Torah, even greater heights. So we, we were just talking, I guess this is a good time to wrap up. We were just, we went through a lot of the blessings. Basically a lot of, and we're going to see this again in Deuteronomy, Devarim, Deuteronomy, Devarim. Once we get there at the end, towards the end of Moshe's life, we're going to see a lot of the blessings and the curse. We see that a lot here. Basically God is saying, if you do what I ask you, if you keep my commandments, if you learn Torah, you're going to get these blessings. And if you don't, and there is a list of uh, curses or uh, reproofs, things of that nature. Uh, so we will start with that, Bezrat Hashem, next week, hopefully early in the week. Hopefully, maybe we will finish. I keep saying that. You guys don't believe me? Maybe you do. So close. We have... like 32 pages to complete the book of Aikra. That's exciting. That is exciting. Okay. Have a great day. Have a beautiful Shabbat, a beautiful weekend. Learn Torah. And of course, don't forget, it's always good to thank God.